Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to this moment that we hear from the mouth of your servant. And we open our hearts and I pray that you will give him grace and anointing that you enjoy the ministry of your word. We pray that the word that is sharper than a double-edged sword will penetrate in our heart and bring the forth right resort as you intended in heaven. We open our hearts and our minds that we submit to you. We ask that, Lord, you be glorified in this. We receive your servant. We receive you. Mm. Thank you for hearing us and thank you for what you have said for the table that we will dine again at your word. We give you honor. We give you glory. Mm. In Jesus' name and the church said, Amen. Amen. Have your seat in the presence of God. Amen. Welcome, Elder, thank to you. bring the word. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. I greet you all in the name of Jesus. Uh, my name is Benson Otemba. I love the Lord as my personal savior. I am married. My wife is Monica. She's seated right there. And we have three adult children. Today we are looking at the family and we want to address the subject enhancing family relationships. One time in Sunday school, the teacher asked the children, where is God? One child raised the hand and said, God is in heaven. And the teacher was very happy. Another one raised the hand and said, God is in my heart. Again, the teacher was very happy with that answer. The third child raised the hand and said, God is in the bathroom. The teacher was alarmed. How come God is in the bathroom? So she inquired further and she discovered that this little boy came from a family where every morning the father would go to the bathroom door and bang on it. My God! My God! Are you still in there? Apparently in that family they had a system, you know, when they woke up to prepare to go to work, the wife would go in, shower first, then come out, then the dad would go in. So apparently the the wife would take a bit of time, so the husband had to go to the door to bang, to ask whether she was still in there. Where is God in your family? According to God's design for the family, the family is the basic unit of society. Family provides the basic social relationships for love, care, and nurture, training in values, and support. What happens at home affects our lives significantly. Broken families often produce broken lives. Families make or break a person. They form the foundation for relational patterns in all other social units, including the church. A good Christian family is one that lines up with biblical principles and one in which each member understands and fulfills his or her God-given role. The family is not an institution designed by man. It was created by God for the benefit of man, and we're using the term man to include all humanity. It was created by God for the benefit of man, and man has been given stewardship over it. The basic biblical family unit is comprised of one man and one woman who is his spouse, and their offspring or adopted children. The extended family can include relatives by blood or marriage, such as grandparents, nieces, nephews, cousins, aunts, and uncles. One of the primary principles of the family unit is that it involves a commitment ordained by God for the lifetime of the members. Satan hates the family. Satan's goal is to destroy the family unit. He hates to see a loving father, a faithful husband, a gracious wife, and obedient, well-disciplined children. He attacked the first family with disobedience to God, and a conflict between brothers followed. The enemy attacked the family through divorce, conflict, violence, sexual immorality, rebellion, separation, 
unforgiveness, hatred, and drugs, to name but a few. We are addressing the subject enhancing family relationships. Within the family, there are a number of relationships. We have spousal relationships, that is, relationship between husband and wife. Then we have filial relationships, which is relationship between parents and children, sibling relationships, that is relationship between brothers and sisters, extended family relationships, including cousins, aunties, uncles, grandparents, in-laws, etc. The reading of our uh, uh, lesson today is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 to 32. Let me read from NIV. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. It says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That is the main text, but I'll make reference to other texts as we go along. When you look at this text, the context of it is such that at the beginning of chapter 4, Paul addresses the unity in the body of Christ. Then further on, he starts talking about living as children of light. What is expected of us as believers? How should we relate with one another? And then he comes to the area that we have just talked about. And then in chapter 5, he addresses the relationship between husbands and wives. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He also in chapter 5, he addresses uh, love and respect. The husband ought to love his wife, and the wife ought to respect her husband. In chapter 6, he addresses the relationship between parents and children. Then he moves on to talk about the relationship between slaves and masters. So this passage of scripture has a certain context that it comes with. This is how I would like to address uh, this subject of enhancing family relationships. I want to talk about how we can create a safe home environment. In many homes, there is literally warfare most of the time. How can we create safe home environments? And I'll give you four points on that. Then we cannot talk about enhancing family relationships without addressing the issue of conflict. Because conflict is the elephant in the room. What is conflict? How do we deal with conflict? And then towards the end, I'll talk about the Prince of Peace. How do we create a safe home environment? The late Dr. Gary Smalley, in his book, The DNA of Relationships, says this. Life is about relationships. The rest is just details. Life is all about relationships. The rest is just details. How do we create a safe home environment? I'll give you four points, and you can write them down right away. The first one is this. Respect the wall. Respect the wall. Secondly, honor one another. Thirdly, suspend judgment. Suspend judgment. Fourthly, value your differences. Value your differences. Let's go step by step. Respect the wall. That's the first point. When people are threatened in a relationship, they build walls. Our natural response is to knock down the wall, and this results in fear. We are perceived to be dangerous. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8, the Bible says, Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. 
Whoever breaks through a wall may be beaten by a snake. Instead of trying to knock down the wall, respect it and create a safe environment. The other person will gradually take down their wall when they feel it is safe to do so. But this is the important point. Whoever builds the wall is the one, is the only one that can take it down safely. Usually when somebody has built the wall, the other person tries to bring it down. That's the wrong approach. You need to allow the one who has built the wall to bring it down safely. What do walls look like? Things like short replies with a gloomy face. Some years ago, we were having breakfast, and our son was then in class seven, uh, listening to our conversation between me and, and his mother, and we were just giving short answers, yes, no, and the like. After breakfast, he cornered the mother in the bedroom, and he said, mom, why are you and dad fighting? And the mother said, no, we are not fighting. And then he said, just make sure you don't divorce. <laughs> Actually, it shook us when we got to hear that. What do walls look like? Short replies with gloomy face. Irritable, impatient, quarrelsome, defensive, constantly accusing each other, turning one's back to your spouse in bed. That's a serious one, isn't it? Talking through children, you know, you, the children are intermediaries. You, you send your son to the mother, the mother comes with, with a reply. Talking through children, talking through texts alone. Texts are not bad, but if the only communication you have is through texts, there is something wrong there. And then, not talking at all, what they call nail by mouth. There are those who can be quiet with each other, even for days and months and yet they are living under the same roof. How do we bring down the wall? Let the person who is hiding know that you know and understand why they erected the wall and that you accept it. Let them know that you are aware that the wall will only come down when they feel safe. Your job is to work on making the person feel safe. That's your responsibility. For example, you can say this. Did I irritate you by something I said? Don't say, why are you so irritable these days? <laughs> no, you're accusing the other person. Why are you so irritable these days? Some of us like to use the words, you're always, or you never. Those are accusatory statements. Remember, you need to resolve the situation and retain the relationship. So, the main thing is for you to retain the relationship. There's a German proverb to the extent that says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is relationship. So, how do we create a safe environment? We need to respect the wall. Secondly, honor one another. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, Peter says this, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your, your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. In Proverbs 12, verse 18, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The text in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 is now focusing on husbands to respect their wives and to be considerate as they deal with them. You know, often we, we like to focus on the Ephesian text where the wife is asked to submit to the husband. But now here, Peter is saying the husband should be considerate to his wife and to be gracious to her. That's honoring one another. When we honor others, we see them as valuable. We see others as God sees them. Honor creates a safe environment in which people can come together. 
Honor sees the immense value of someone made in God's image. When we honor and affirm the value of people, we create a safe environment for them to thrive. How can we practically honor other people? You can keep a list of all the good qualities of that person. Keep a list of all the good qualities of that person. And then review the list in private whenever you are angry at that person. And then affirm them in the hearing of others. And then compliment them often. Do not correct in public. For example, maybe your wife is such a wonderful mother. She has raised your kids in a, a lovely way, and you are proud of it. However, she is a poor cook. Often you eat burnt offerings, <laughs> you know. But you, you, you don't dwell on the fact that she's a poor cook. You affirm her because she's a good mother. Because if she's a poor cook, you can hire somebody to cook for you, can't you? In Proverbs 17, verse 9, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. So the point is, do not repeat a matter from the past. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then the passage we read in Ephesians 4.29, it says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful to building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, sometimes we tend to speak everything, you know, that comes to your mind. You don't have to. You need to choose what to say. Because sometimes the things we say bring down the other person. Within a family setting, I have found from experience that we need to operate on the currency of goodwill. What is the currency of goodwill? The currency of goodwill means that Within the relationship, when somebody offends you, it is not that they have planned to offend you. So you should give them a benefit of doubt. Seek to understand why have they done what they have done. It is not that they were out to be malicious to you. So the currency of goodwill is extremely important in nurturing vibrant relationships. When we say hurtful things to people, we take value away from them. Honor each other verbally and say encouraging words. Again, as we saw in Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So we have seen to create a safe environment, we need to respect the world. Secondly, we need to honor one another. Thirdly, we need to suspend judgment. In Matthew 7, 1 to 5, the Bible says this, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This passage of scripture goes to emphasize the fact that within a relationship, we tend to magnify the offenses of others or the shortcomings of others, and we diminish our own shortcomings. So the other person looks bad and you try to look good. We are being told when you operate like that, you are actually a hypocrite. Recently, I came across something on the social media. It says this, I came home from work, tired. I sat down on the sofa and put my feet up. 
My wife brought me a glass of water. My son gave me a sheet of paper and I read through. This is what the, the, the sheet of paper said. English, 17%. Biology, 35%. Mathematics, 40%. Physics, 37%. Chemistry, 42%. Economics, 12%. Agriculture, 19%. Geography, 22%. Suddenly, I lost my temper and started shouting. What is this? All the time you are on the phone and TV. How dare you bring me such marks? How dare you? My wife said, be patient. Listen. But I interjected. Shut up. It's your love and pampering that has spoiled him. He is no good and never serious at all. My wife said, oh, really? I shouted. No one in our family has performed so badly ever. My son said, Dad, I'm sorry I made you angry. I was clearing the old cupboard and I found this. It is your old school report card. <laughs> it is dated 27th July 1977, sir. I looked at the top and it was actually my own report sheet. My name was boldly inscribed on it. I became humbled, gentle, and dumbfounded. Imagine the atmosphere afterwards. Calmness in the air. With a foolish grin on my face, I replied, Son, you know, in those days, food was scarce. To create a safe environment, we need to suspend judgment. When we have an interest in people, rather than judge them, relationships have a better chance of growing. When we judge, people feel hurt, they feel attacked, they feel alone. For example, if you went to another town where your daughter is attending school, and suddenly you discover that your daughter is six months pregnant, what do you do? You can choose to say this. I paid school fees, and you're going around fooling around. Now see what has happened. You can diminish her and just cause her to feel like the ground should open. Alternatively, you can choose to say, how are you? Can I buy you some coffee so we can talk? You know, the same thing, but you can approach it in a different way. I'm not saying it's easy, but we need to get to a point where we suspend judgment, give the other person the opportunity to give their point of view, then you can make your own judgment. When people feel judged, they close up or may fight back in defense. They suspend judgment on self and others, Instead of judging, express real interest in the person. Get to know what the person is going through. Express compassion or empathy, and the person will open up. Compassion and understanding creates a tremendous amount of safety. Refuse to judge the motives of others, and instead try to understand why they made the decisions they did. Judgment results in defensiveness, closes down relationships. Curiosity, on the other hand, results in openness and safety, giving life to relationships. Listen to people, ask good questions, get to know them by what they say and feel. And I want to talk to parents of teenagers and young adults who are in, the, in our midst. This category of children really hate lectures from Avoid lecturing your teenagers, avoid lecturing your young adults. The best approach is to ask questions. Ask questions, and they will open up, they'll tell you what has happened. Then they let you into, into their world. But when you begin lecturing them, they shut up, and you can never get through. How do we create a safe environment? First, we saw we respect the wall. Secondly, honor one another. Thirdly, suspend judgment. And lastly, 
value your differences. When we value our differences, rather than make them the focus of our conflict, we create a safe environment. When two people are in conflict, they point to their differences as the source of conflict. Differences are a blessing if we know how to deal with them and capitalize on them. For example, when we were newly married, my wife was preparing a, a traditional vegetable which we call murenda in Kiswahili. Do you know it? Yes. And I observed what she was doing, and I was utterly shocked. Because where I grew up, my mother never fried mrenda. But I saw now my wife was cutting tomatoes and frying mrenda. I was really lost for words. But I said, OK, let me just see. This is a new thing. Let me see how it turns out. Eventually, it was served, and I ate it, and I enjoyed it. So I forgot about the fact that she prepares it in a different way. And then also, in the course of time, I encouraged her to learn to make a certain meal that I love very much, something called peanut sauce, something she had never made in her, in her mother's home when she was growing up. And so you can see that we were operating on valuing our differences rather than focusing on our differences as the cause of conflict in our relationship. By working with differences, you both feel like winners. You discover more about the other person and yourself. Let me say, a relationship must make room for all of both people for it to feel safe. A relationship must make room for all of both people for it to feel safe. What do I mean by that? In a relationship, somebody comes with the baggage, they come with their past, the way they are socialized. You cannot say, I like this part and I don't like the other part. No, you accept the person as they come. So you must make room for this person. If you show them that there's a part of them you don't like, it means you are rejecting them. And that's not a good thing for uh, a relationship. So think of someone who really irritates you. What specifically about them irritates you? When someone's behavior irritates you, Look inside yourself to see if you are guilty of something similar. When others reveal my imperfections, I'm likely to be irritated. Let me give you an example of how we can value different, our differences. Uh, you may have uh, two daughters. One is called Mary. She's 14 years old. She struggles with mathematics. The other daughter is called Martha. She's 10 years old and has no challenge with mathematics. And you can choose to terrorize Mary. When she struggles with mathematics, you can pick the question and take it to Martha, who is 10 years old, and you let Martha do it so that you can make Mary feel bad about it. You get the point? You say, Mary, how come you can't do this and Martha can do it and she's 10 years? and you are 14. So you are not dwelling on the differences. But you may find that Mary, who is 14 years old, gets up early and cleans the house, makes it tidy and cooks the meals, so she has some certain strengths. However, Martha, on the other hand, who is 10 years old, is sloppy and does not keep the room tidy. So you can see every person has their strengths and their weaknesses. You can choose to dwell on the weaknesses to demean that person. Or you can choose to dwell on their strengths so that you can show that you value the differences that are in this person. Like I said, we cannot talk about enhancing family relationships without addressing the issue of conflict. What is conflict? Conflict is a difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals and desires. A difference in opinion or purpose that frustrates someone's goals and desires. One wonders, is conflict good or bad? I think it all depends on how you deal with it. In fact, I am aware that where there is conflict, that is evidence that a relationship still exists. 
So in a sense, conflict is a good thing. It tells you that the relationship still exists. Conflict can reveal blind spots in our lives that need attention or correction. Conflict can provide opportunities to talk about issues and increase our understanding of each other. Conflict can lead to either misunderstanding or greater understanding. It can lead to misunderstanding because it creates a distance between the two of you which leads to silence. But it can also lead to greater understanding. So you discuss the matter, then you become close, and then you have better communication among yourselves. So it depends on how you deal with it. Let me tell you this. Conflict is normal, but people have different styles of dealing with it. There are those who choose to withdraw. Whenever there's conflict, they withdraw. They, they avoid confrontation because they know that they cannot win. They have tried before, but they have always lost, so they withdraw. Others choose to win at all costs. There are people who are in a position where, when there's a conflict, they, they push it so hard until they win, you know, because they're doing it for their own self-esteem. Their self-esteem depends on it. They say, for I can never admit I was wrong. So when you win at all, at all costs, the relationship suffers. The other way is to yield. You know, you say, I don't like conflict, and so even if I feel I'm right, I just give in. That is not healthy for the relationship. The fourth way is to compromise. Each is willing to give and take so that both are sometimes winners. So give and take, you, you have a middle ground. Again, it may work for a while, but it's not really good for the relationship. The best way is to resolve the conflict. We work it out and come up with an answer so that both of us are winners. I want to use an illustration taken from animals which describes how we respond in a situation of conflict. And I want to address, let's take the example of husband and wife, you know, spouses. So what kind of animal are you when it comes to dealing with conflict. The first animal is the gorilla. And we call this the, the gorilla, the chump. For this kind of person, every conflict is an opportunity to win or be right. They never quit until the other partner has seen their point of view. They use weapons like temper, intimidation, manipulations, etc. They do whatever it takes to win. They have to win at all costs. Let me ask you, are you a gorilla? Or is your spouse a gorilla? I would like you to evaluate your own relationships. The second animal is the skunk. The skunk is an animal that produces an awful smell to drive away its enemies, the skunk. And we call this the skunk, the retaliator. They are always ready to fight back when challenged. They make the other person look bad. They use sarcasm and blaming. And the argument ends up being on other issues. Have you ever been in an argument with someone? You are addressing a particular issue and slowly the argument drifts to other issues that are not the subject of, of the interaction. This is a typical skunk, the retaliator. The third animal is the hedgehog. The hedgehog or the defender. Their life motto is this. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. They deny any having done wrong. Their partner is the one on the wrong. They never want to be associated as being a part of creating the mess. That is the hedgehog or the defender. The fourth animal is the owl, that bird that has eyes like this. The owl is the analyzer. The spouse who intellectualizes issues, for this kind of spouse, feelings are inferior. They approach issues with academic logical facts. They can be irritating as they assume beforehand 
they know what the partner is thinking and feeling. In the middle, owls will sometimes interrupt, they roll their eyes and rehearse what they are going to say next. They come across as intellectual and superior. This is how they run away from issues and keep the partner at a distance. The owl, the analyzer. Are you an owl? Is your spouse an owl? The fifth one is the tortoise. The tortoise is the withdrawer. They pull back to shell when they feel threatened. For them, shell could be work, newspaper, TV, laptop, silence. Any of these can, can serve as a shell. They are very frustrating to the spouse. The tortoise can see things but does not want to confront. This increases tension. One time there was a couple that was having some issues. The wife tried to raise the matter with the husband. Whenever she attempted to draw his attention, he would deflect it all the time. So she came up with a strategy. She decided that she would make the meal he loves so much. And it happened to be chapati and beef stew. And then she served it on the, you know, the kind of plate that you reserve for guests. You know, in some homes, certain things are just reserved for guests only. So she served the food when he came home, and she walked majestically approaching him, and his eyes looked up and they lit up. And then he said, oh, sweetie. You know, he was now excited because the meal he loves is being brought to him. As she got close to him, she raised the plate and smashed it against the wall, and everything splattered. Then he asked, sweetie, what's wrong? And then she said, all along I've been trying to get your attention, but now I have your full attention. <laughs> you don't have to go to that extent. So that particular spouse who was behaving that way is a typical tortoise or the withdrawer. The last animal is the ostrich. The ostrich or the denier. The ostrich is similar to the tortoise, but instead of retreating, they bury their head in the sand and pretend things are okay. You know, they like to crack jokes. Their life motto is this Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> These are very frustrating to the spouse. They are normally popular at home, outside home, and they use their wit and humor to deflect, to hide from the spouse. And this leaves the spouse feeling guilt and may end up blaming themselves, wondering whether they are the ones who seem to be having issues in marriage. What kind of person are you in terms of the way you handle conflict? Are you an ostrich, the denier? And what is your spouse like? In conclusion, we are talking about enhancing family relationships. And we have said we need to focus on creating a safe home environment. And I shared that we have four ways we can do that. The first is respect the world, honor one another, suspend judgment, and value your differences. But lastly, let me say this. In Romans 12, verse 18, the Bible says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I will say it again. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That is really the goal of family harmony. Make every effort to ensure that you live at peace with members of your own family. Or even it can be work colleagues or whoever you're interacting with. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. But let me tell you that you cannot succeed in this unless you invite the Prince of Peace in your heart. 
and the Prince of Peace is Jesus Christ. There could be someone in our midst today who has never considered inviting Jesus to come into their life. I want to challenge you to reflect on this and to make the right decision. Because in your own efforts, you will not be able to enhance a healthy family relationships without having the Prince of Peace resident in your own, in your own heart. And as pastor comes to lead us in prayer, I would like us just to focus on the fact that the Lord would have us establish families where there is peace, where there is a, a, a loving environment, where we can raise children in a way that will honor God, where husband-wife relationship is working, which is actually the primary relationship, and parent-child relationship also is working, and that is a secondary relationship. It's up to us, each one of us taking our individual responsibility to ensure that we enhance uh, family relationships. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you. Wow.